now that we played the game to learn more about the game mechanics in the first episode and that we have set up our own server in the second episode, we can finally start gathering technical information about the game and start reverse engineering the client. The very first lead that we get is provided on the official website. Our hackable components all live in their own sandbox. The netcode and game logic are completely custom, so you won't have to hack the engine Unreal 4 itself. That is already a very good information and we will keep that in mind. So my plan right now is not immediately to try to hack anything, that's stupid. I have no clue what to do. So first I want to get a good overview of the whole thing and then that will lead to information I can probably use to dig even deeper. I'm essentially doing information gathering or reconnaissance. And sure, I will poke certain parts that I find intriguing and have a quick deeper look, but it makes no sense wanting to jump into a hole right away if you don't even know where the holes are. We also have three different clients, a Windows, Linux and Mac client. And obviously the code had to be compiled for each one of them differently. But also probably not every file is different. So I thought it might be interesting to look at the differences and similarities. To do that I wrote a simple Python script that simply walks the directory tree to get all files and then creates hashes of all of them in order to figure out which files are identical and which files are unique. So let's try this out on the clean client files downloaded from pwnadventure.com. And we can see quite a lot of files are identical. Some DLLs, some config files, nothing sounds too interesting. Maybe you wonder why there are DLLs in the Linux and Mac clients, because DLLs are for Windows. That's because this game is based on Mono, and Mono is a cross-platform open source.NET framework. So this allows you basically to write Windows.NET applications and compile them to run on Mac and Linux. The unique files are also not that interesting. You can see different binaries for the different systems. So dylib is a dynamic library for Mac, while on Linux it's an SO file, a shared object. But the clients we just compared are essentially just the launcher. The actual game is downloaded during the update process. So here I have gathered all three updated game directories, and so let's run the script on it as well. Each fully updated client is around 2 gigabytes of files each, so this will take a little bit to run. Hashing those big files will take us a few seconds. Okay, so now we have a lot more files to compare. But they are all pretty boring. A lot of any files, so these are mostly config files, and also a lot of .pack files. These are, based on the name I assume, the actual 3D files and stuff like that. Though, it's a bit weird to me that other resource files, such as mapterrain.pack, are different on each system. I would have assumed all of them are the same, but whatever. Nothing really looks that interesting here. Though this way you might discover a file that is called GameLogic. A GameLogic DLL for Windows, a GameLogic DYLib for Mac, and a shared object libGameLogic for Linux. Hmm. But let's have a bit more dynamic approach. Like I said in the first video, I mostly do this on Linux, so let's start with that and execute the launcher. But the launcher is not the real game, so let's just hit play and wait for the actual game to have started. Once it's on the main menu, we look at the process tree with PS tree and some flags to get more details. Here it is, Pwn Adventure 3 has this process ID. The children of this process here are threads, indicated by the curly braces. And each thread was also given a meaningful name, which is quite awesome. So we have an async IO thread, some message passing stuff, the main thread, I guess, RT remote or real time heartbeat, a render thread, SDL timer, and SDL is a framework often used for games, so no surprise here, a task graph, and I don't know. Okay, let's take the process ID and look for it in the regular process list. So this binary that was executed lies in the launcher directory, but then Pwn Adventure 3 data, Pwn Adventure 3, Pwn Adventure 3 binaries, Linux, and then the file is called Pwn Adventure 3 Linux shipping. Let's exit the game and see what happens when we call it directly. We see some kind of debug or log output and then the game is actually starting. 
So we have just bypassed, so to say, the launcher or updater and figured out how to directly start the game. Next, let's look at the proc file system. That's like magical Linux stuff. It looks like folders and files, it feels like folders and files, but it's actually a bit more magic than that. However, we can explore it like files. So we go to slash proc and the process ID of our currently executed game. And with ls we can see the available folders and files. For example, here you can check all the environment variables, the command lines on how the program was executed, but also the memory map of the virtual memory of this process. The output is huge for this game. So let's pipe it into less so we can scroll more nicely. So up here we have our game binary mapped into memory. Then some memory areas that are used for something else, probably a lot of different heaps and mapped memory of the game files and stuff like that. Let's just skip to the end with shift G. Okay, so here are the addresses of our stack, the Linux dynamic loader and linker. And if we scroll up, we find some other dynamic libraries used by the game. libthread, libdl and the libgame logic again. Interesting librt, libm, and libstd, c++. So we might actually have a game written in c++ here. libcrypto, hmm. We can also search for mono here with slash mono enter, and then with n and shift n we can search for it again. Though it doesn't appear in this process. So it looks like only the launcher is written in .NET using the mono framework. The game itself is not. Let's have a quick look at the binaries themselves. Let's start with the file command. So the main game binary here is a 64-bit executable. It's dynamically linked and stripped, so no debugging information available. With LDD, we can see which dynamic libraries it requires. And here we can also find the libgamelogic.so again. Most of the other libraries are system libraries. So these just offer basic functionality like threading and crypto functions. But the game library most certainly is something that has to do with the game itself, obviously. If we check the file output for that binary, we see that it's a shared object, so not a standalone executable. It's also dynamically linked and is not stripped. Damn, so that means we get a lot of debug information. Before we leave the proc file system, let's quickly check the FD folder. That folder contains a list of all the currently open file descriptors and to which file they point. Which means this is a list of all the files currently accessed by the game. 0, 1 and 2 are obviously standard in, standard out and standard error, so pretty standard, but all the other ones are other files. As you can see, most of them are .pack resource files. Now let's try to head into the game. Connection error failed to load master server certificate. Uh oh. I guess it wasn't that easy to bypass the updater and make it work. Let's see if we can fix that. We execute the launcher again, head into the game and then verify that we can connect and find that server certificate. Yep. Okay. So let's find the process ID of this process now by listing all the processes and grabbing for pwn. And then we go to cd slash proc slash the process ID. Now let's see if uh, the process was executed with any special command line arguments. We can do that by reading the command line file. But no, nope, it's just a binary path, which is always the first command line argument. No additional ones used. Then let's check the environment variables. You can also cut the file, but the file is not pretty. The variables are null byte separated. But we can pipe the file into sed and use a simple replace rule to match all the null bytes and replace them with new lines. Now we get a nice formatted output. But I didn't see any special environment variables either. Also the current working directory is the same as from where we launched it previously. So I just played around with it a bit and simply went into the folder of the binary and executed from there. And then it worked. Oh well. There's me trying to be smart. Anyway. Let's do one last thing, and that is investigating the networking side. To do that, I drop into the game and start by checking netstat. With netstat and minus "-a", for showing both listening and non-listening sockets, as well as minus "-c", to continuously print connections, then grabbing the output for pwn, we see that the game periodically connects to master.pwn3 on port 3333 and 3002. Port 3333 is the master server as specified in the server any file, but port 3002 is the actual game server. 
But master and game server are on the same IP, so instead of showing game.pwn3, it shows master.pwn3. Next, let's exit the game again and open Wireshock. Then monitor any interface and filter for all TCP packets to port 3333. And filter for only packets that contain a payload, so where the TCP length is larger than zero. Then launch the game again, and I also log in with an account. If we peek into the content of the packets, it looks like binary, and we can't immediately see what it stands for. It's certainly not like HTTP human readable JSON data or something like that. However, there are a few ASCII strings in there, which is an indication that it might not be encrypted. Ghost in the shell code. That was the name of the CTF this was part of. However, these packets going from the client to the server with all the same size change a lot. So that looks more like encrypted content or maybe just compressed. But we did see some lib crypto earlier. So yeah, we don't know yet. Now let's switch to port 3002, which we saw in Netstat to be assigned as our game server. There's a lot more action here. The game constantly sends updates to the server and receive updates. Of course, it's an MMO, so we expect a flood of packets. Let's go back to the start. Wireshark tells us that these are some weird packets. However, that doesn't look right to me at all. Wireshark tries to guess and decode certain protocols, but it looks like it might be something custom. Of course, layers below the Ethernet, TCP and IP layer are okay, just the payload of TCP is probably something custom. So in order to not get wrong decrypted protocols, I go into the settings and disable all the enabled protocols and just enable Ethernet, IPv4, TCP and this other Linux layer. Okay, that looks less awful now. So these packets are much smaller, which also makes sense. With every little change you want to inform the server and vice versa. All these packets with size 70 are actually just two bytes of data of actual TCP payload. The values changing here belong to the Ethernet IP and TCP protocol layer. For example, that part here is the timestamp. So that probably doesn't interest us. We probably want to focus on the data and the server just sent us a lot of zeros. Okay, so here we have the first time I think the client sent something to the server. Actual ASCII data. So that doesn't look encrypted either but I don't know what it stands for yet. After that, it sends a huge bunch of packets with the same data. Hmm. Maybe we see nothing happen because nothing happens in the game? Let's go down where there's more action. And let's try to do some stuff. Then we observe the traffic while playing the game. Walking around doesn't immediately show a change, however jumping triggers a slightly larger packet and actually it seems to trigger two, one for initiating the jump and one for getting back onto the ground. Because of walking and looking around, we can also see some slight changes in the previous packets. So this is an indication that it's not encrypted and it might be simply our position in the game world. And jumping added something to it, but a lot of it stays the same, so it might be something like I jumped at this position and I landed on this position. I think we already learned a lot about the game today. No worries, I won't show every little detail I play around with, but it was important to me to show you that it's important to investigate and that you can slowly and incrementally learn more about the game, how it works, and that can be fun too. Also, by the way, make notes of these things. While doing this, I was writing down what I did and what I found, because this way I don't forget a week later what I already discovered. And next week, we will open the disassembler.